This is February and I'd like to welcome you to Black History Month, better known to mainstream as Dr. Martin Luther King Month. Everything Dr. Martin Luther King. School curriculums, Dr. King. News reports, TV shows, Dr. King. Luncheons, dinners, events, Dr. King. So let's not change tradition now. Let's learn about Dr. King. The parts of Dr. King's life and especially his death that they'll never teach you. Good evening. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Police have issued an all points bulletin for a well dressed young white man seen running from the scene. Officers also reportedly chased and fired on a radio equipped car containing two white men. Dr. King was standing on the balcony of a second floor hotel room tonight when, according to a companion, a shot was fired from across the street. In the friend's words, the bullet exploded in his face. In 1999, new evidence surfaced painting a totally different picture than the one we were initially sold pertaining to the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. The old image was of a white racist man by the name of James Earl Ray who took a rifle and from the bathroom window of a rooming house across the street from the Lorraine Hotel on a solo mission, fired a shot on April 4th, 1968, killing Dr. King. Uh, the police here in Memphis immediately issued a bulletin for a young white man dressed in dark clothes who dashed out of that building across the street. Uh, he dropped a Browning automatic rifle which was fitted with a scope on the sidewalk and then he fled. With mounds of evidence and testimonies, William Peppers, an attorney, will represent the King family in the 1999 wrongful death civil action suit of King versus Lord Jowers and co-conspirators, which exposed that James Earl Ray was not the culprit. And it definitely was not a solo mission. Lloyd Jowers, the owner of Jim's Bar and Grill, located across from the Lorraine Hotel, stepped forward, telling his story to Sam Donaldson on ABC Primetime. According to the transcript of that interview, a mafia-connected produce dealer named Frank Liberto approached him to assist in the murder plot of King. Liberto had a carrier deliver $100,000 to Jowers' restaurant with instructions to hold the money. And on the day of the murder, a man by the name Raul, the same man that helped frame James Earl Ray, showed up with a rifle in a box. The case would show that these front men were only an accomplice to a larger conspiracy, one involving the U.S. government. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We've had in our area here outside agitation groups of all levels. We've had Martin Luther King, uh, King pardon me sir, Martin, Martin Luther King. The mayor of this city, the police commissioner of this city, and everybody in the white power structure of this city must take a responsibility for everything that Jim Clark does in this city. As early as the 1950s, Dr. King's activities and organizations was targeted by COINTELPRO. His every move was under constant federal surveillance to neutralize King as an effective leader. And of course, to get even closer to King, they paid and supplied informants to infiltrate King's camp. Jowers claimed the meetings to assassinate King took place at Jim's Grill, which included undercover Memphis Police Merrill McCulloch, Memphis Police Lieutenant Earl Clark, a third police officer, and two men Jowers thought to be federal agents. Leading up to the plot to completely silence King, the goal was to make him totally vulnerable on his return trip to Memphis by removing any security detail who could be a witness and sympathetic to him. In 
April 3rd, two black firefighters, Floyd Newson and Norval Wallace, who were working at fire station number two across the street from the Lorraine Motel, were each transferred to different fire stations. Newson, an activist himself, was at the last speech that King would give before receiving the call to change his location. Jerry Williams, a black detective for Memphis Police, typically tasked with securing an all-black security team to accompany King when in Memphis. This time, wasn't assigned to form that team. The TAC-10 police escort team, who normally provide Memphis police cars that accompany King, was pulled back. Ed Reddit, a black police officer was removed from his surveillance post and sent home against his will one hour prior to King's assassination. The Invaders, a group similar to the Black Panthers, who were also staying at the Lorraine Hotel, was helping King to organize. They were ordered to leave around 5.30 p.m. after someone telling the Lorraine staff that the SCLC would not pay for their rooms for the night. Reluctantly, they departed around 5.50 p.m. With all possible obstacles out of the way, Dr. Martin Luther King now stood alone, prepped for the assassination. On April 4th, by 6.01 p.m., military intelligence set up photographers on the roof of the fire station with clear view to Dr. King's balcony and the 20th Special Forces Group, the Green Beret, had an eight-man sniper team at the assassination location. Lloyd Jowers stated after the shot was fired, he received a smoking rifle at the rear of the door from Lieutenant Earl Clark. He broke it down, wrapped it up, and was disposed of by taxi cab driver James McGraw, a longtime friend. And to complete the plot, it was imperative for the U.S. government to cover up their involvement. And they did. Several witnesses identified activity coming from the bushes behind Jim's grill. And not one was questioned. Although, one cab driver, Buddy Butlers, did get an opportunity to report what he saw. Buddy Butler was loading a customer's luggage in his car when the shot rang and reported that he saw a man running from the scene right after the shot, going south on Mulberry Street and jumping into a police car. Butler immediately called dispatch and reported it. Butler was interviewed at the Yellow Cab Company later that evening by police. Louis Ward would later find out that Buddy Butler's body was thrown out of a speeding car on Route 55 in Memphis. And 7 a.m., April 5th, the next morning, Maynard Stiles, a senior official at the Memphis Sanitation Department, received a call from Memphis Police Department, Inspector Sam Evans requesting to clear the bushes and debris from the lot adjacent the hotel. The crime scene was sanitized, wiped clean. So the alibi of James Earl Ray shooting Dr. King from a bathroom window would appear more believable. After 70 testimonies and mounds of evidence, 12 jurors, six white, six black, deliberated for one hour before revealing the verdict. King versus Lord Jowers and co-conspirators, including J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, Richard Helms and the CIA, the U.S. military, the local Memphis police, and organized crime figures from New Orleans and Memphis. And in what should have been the court case of the century was silent. Only one local newsman covered the trial. According to the trial, the same government that honors King was found guilty in conspiring to kill him. But what we must understand is why. The persona that they create of King. I have a dream. I have a dream. I have a dream. I still have a dream. Is not the man that they silenced. 
the man that pushed further than civil rights. Years after his dream, Dr. King began to focus on three issues, racism, war, poverty. We must also realize that the problems of racial injustice and economic injustice cannot be solved without a radical redistribution of political and economic power. The other thing I want you to understand is this, that it didn't cost the nation one penny to integrate lunch counters. It didn't cost the nation one penny to guarantee the right to vote. But now we are dealing with issues that cannot be solved without the nation spending billions of dollars and undergoing a radical redistribution of economic power. Yes, yes. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is the reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. His second issue, war. Nothing more clearly demonstrates our nation's abuse of military power than our tragic adventure in Vietnam. Dr. King, when you speak out against this war, do you speak as a Negro opponent of the war? Is there something especially anti-Negro or racist about the war that impels you to speak out? I cannot overlook the fact that uh, I am a Negro and that this war is doing a great deal to destroy the lives of thousands and thousands of my brothers and sisters. We are dying physically in disproportionate numbers in Vietnam. Some 22 uh, and 4 tenths percent of the deaths, even though we are only about 11 percent of the population. It has frustrated our development of home at home, telling our own underprivileged citizens that we place insatiable military demands above their most critical needs. It has greatly contributed to the forces of reaction in America and strengthened the military-industrial complex. And it has practically destroyed Vietnam. Many of our senators and congressmen vote joyously to appropriate billions of dollars for the war in Vietnam. And many of these same senators and congressmen vote loudly against the Fair Housing Bill to make it possible for a Negro veteran of Vietnam to purchase a decent home. We arm Negro soldiers to kill on foreign battlefields, but offer little protection for their relatives from beatings and killings in our own South. We are willing to make the Negro 100% of a citizen in warfare, but reduce him to 50% of a citizen on American soil. And last, with the Poor People's Campaign, was his stance on poverty. All labor has dignity. Yes. But you are doing another thing. You are reminding not only Memphis, but you are reminding the nation that it is a crime 
for people to live in this rich nation and receive starvation wages. America's opportunity to help bridge the gulf between the haves and the have-nots. And the question is whether America will do it. There's nothing new about poverty. What is new is that we now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. And the real question is whether we have the will. And in the spring of 1968, Dr. King had plans to bring attention to these issues by bringing hundreds of thousands of poor people to an encampment in Washington, D.C., which caused a panic to the U.S. government. Their plan was to camp out until America pulled out of the Vietnam War and to reinvest that never-ending flow of money made available for war to dominate another country back into his citizens to help fight poverty in this nation. And although King preached a nonviolent message, they were terrified that demonstrators' anger level would increase and they feared that a more radical group would take over and spark a revolution. A revolution that they didn't have the troops to put down. The truth is, that was a reason for Dr. King's assassination, and it wasn't his stance on nonviolence and social integration. It is time for us to weed through the intentional deceptions about Dr. King and study him for ourselves, because what he died fighting is not only facing us today, but it has magnified. So I ask you, will you celebrate his legacy with this symbolic ceremony, or will you have the audacity to continue his fight? our fight, which is even more necessary today. The first person to comment on this video stating what you appreciate about Dr. Martin Luther King, I will send you my personal copy of An Act of State, signed by the Great Griot.